safetyfm.com with Jay Allen. Changing safety cultures one broadcast and one podcast at a time. Welcome to Safety FM, where we talk about safety that's truly inspired by you. Hello and welcome to Safety FM. This episode of the broadcast and the podcast is brought to you by Safety Focus Moment. There are consultants that want to help you get to the safety culture that you've been looking for. For more information, go to safetyfocusmoment.com. Well, hello and welcome to Safety FM. This is Jay Allen. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking to David Sowers. He is a founding member of Knowledge Vine, a human performance training and consulting organization. He started his career in the U.S. Nuclear Power Program, where he served abroad the aircraft carrier, the USS George Washington. After the Navy, Dave started working the commercial nuclear power as an operator and trainer. Dave returned to government service with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Throughout his career, Dave has served in many diverse roles, including plant operator, trainer, emergency responder, and control room supervisor, and power plant manager. So today, the conversation with David Sowers will revolve about human organizational performance. Enjoy the interview with David Sowers here on Safety FM. Safety FM. Hello and welcome to Safety FM. On the line, I have David Sowers. He is the vice president at Knowledge Vine. How are you doing today? Doing well. How about yourself? Oh, pretty good. Well, thank you for coming on to Safety FM, and we've been kind of communicating back and forth via email. And now that we have you on, what I would like to do, if you don't mind, can you give us a brief description of what your company does? Well, Knowledge Vine, we do uh, error reduction that works. So we look at uh, organizations from a human performance standpoint to try to minimize the frequency and severity of errors in the workplace. That's, in a nutshell, what we do. We where um, we brought this out of nuclear power and tried to uh, denuke it, make it where it was a little more uh, relatable and understandable into other organizations and, and easier to adapt. And uh, we're bringing it into a lot of high risk uh, organizations like utilities and pipelines and things like that to help uh, manage air when it happens and to uh, reduce the frequency of errors. So, David, how did you get started down this path? I know normally most people don't wake up and say, hey, I want to get into the safety profession and definitely looking at the nuke aspect of stuff and then jumping in into doing this. So what got you involved with safety? Well, I started in the uh, nuclear Navy. I was in there for a few years. When I got out, I worked in commercial nuclear power. And human performance has its roots in uh, commercial nuclear power. It actually came out of a three-mile island where they had a a little accident there and and they came in and did an investigation and uh, determined that although we had all these great systems and this engineering and the designs were great and we had all these things in place to protect the people from the plant, we never really looked at how do we protect the plant from the people and the decisions and the choices that they're making. And over the last 40 years, uh, nuclear power has been refining that. So when I got into nuclear power, you step in and it's just the culture. This is what we do, this is how we operate. And going from the Navy to you know your first real industrial um, setting, I was just kind of, hey, this is the way it goes. Um, but even within there, at a nuclear power plant, uh, we had a switch yard where the, you know, power would go to a switch yard and then go to transmission distribution, they'd pick it up. Um, sometimes we'd have to go out there and interface with uh, the transmission distribution wing of the company and you, walk out there and you say, hey, could I get a peer check or do we have a procedure for this? And they kind of look at you like a cow looks at a new gate. You know, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. It's sort of amazing that we had the same shirts on with the same company logo. And I was operating in a way that was completely different from their understanding and the way that they were operating. When I left nuclear power, uh, went and worked with the, uh, at a hydroelectric and walked into there and, and again was expecting that this is the way safety goes. We're going to look at behaviors. We're going to understand uh, the traps that set us up to make errors. We're going to put in place the tools to help us mitigate those traps. And again, it was like I was speaking a foreign language. Uh, and it, 
really the the more you sat there and, and watched this happening, the more you're kind of like, wow, I, I've seen this go right. I've seen how safe we can be and still maintain productivity. And it's just not being adopted. Well, one of my friends from uh, the nuclear power days, he stayed in nuclear power and worked his way up. David Bowman, he's um, one of the uh, owners of Knowledge Vine with myself. Um, he was trying to take with the organization we were working for at that time, or he was working for at that time, he was trying to pull human performance and let's get it out into um, fossil generation or other other parts of the company because they saw how successful it was in nuclear and of course wanted to see if they could extend it out. Um, it got to be a, a bit of a struggle the way that they were rolling it out. There wasn't a lot of leadership commitment. It was kind of like a, hey, go do this. And we had the opportunity to step out and say, you know what, let's Let's build this the way that we know works. Uh, we both came up from the ground up. You know, we both you know went in as plan operators and worked our way up through the food chain. So we have that perspective of, you know, you're in uh, three layers of anti-contamination clothing with a respirator underneath the reactor, and it's 100 degrees and humid, and, and they're telling you, you know, stop, think, act, review, and it seems impossible. But you know, we've done it. We've seen how it works, so we understand what the worker is going through, what that frontline person is going through and the challenges they face. And we felt like we could um, bring a process and, and help that guy to uh, make their job easier, to make it safer and to get them to understand that, that it's not overly complicated. It doesn't have to be that, that tough. There's some pretty basic principles that if we can adhere to, we can get everybody home safer. We can all you know go home today the way we showed up this morning, hopefully. And that was what uh, motivated us to really get out there and, and try to see if we could make a difference in other industries by bringing a, a, a version of uh, human performance or our twist on human performance that really focuses on how do you apply this? Because we hear a lot about, um, you know, here's the information and here's theory and we're, we're gonna build awareness. And every time, Somebody say, well, we're aware of this, or I'm aware that this person is, is going to operate like that, or I'm aware that I'm getting it. Well, what do you, you know, awareness is great, but what are you going to do with it? It's like that um, uh, life, I think it's LifeLock commercial where they're robbing the bank, and the security guard says, you know, somebody's like, hey, do something. They're robbing the bank. Says, oh, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just here to alert you. You know, that, that awareness without actually taking any action doesn't get us too far. So what can we actually do in, in a way that, to apply these principles that, that day in, day out to help move the needle and actually make some difference and, and reduce the frequency and severity of errors. Well, David, I have to tell you, you answered quite a bit in that one. So it's going to probably take me a little bit here to actually be able to unpack everything that you said. So let me kind of just go back a little bit. You stated at the very beginning that you were actually in the, in, in the Navy. That was correct? That's correct. Okay. And so then you went in and pulled some information from the Department of Energy is kind of what you guys were using. And then you went into the to the private sector and doing it. When you walked into doing that right out of the bat, keep in mind that, you know, a lot of people don't have, well, a good chunk of people have not heard of human organizational performance. And a lot of people have the, the belief system. I like to use the word belief system of behavior-based safety. Did you have a hard time trying to implement human organizational performance to people that are behavior-based safety, or how did that actually go about at the very beginning? Uh, at the onset, it, uh, to be honest with you, I, I, I didn't know much better. You go from the Navy, which is more you know regimented, uh, a little less free will, this is the way you're going to do it, and you know, by God, you better do it that way. Uh, very, very tight controls, and you're in a very tight environment you know you, we, I was on an aircraft carrier there's you know, 6,000 people and not a lot of square footage so it was easy to see what was going on it was easy to monitor and manage and, and coach and, and oversight and hold people accountable and responsible for what they do and then when I, I left the Navy and went into nuclear power that's when they really started talking about uh, the, the human performance and your behaviors and your tools and traps because now we're going to get you on this facility that's, you know, hundreds of acres and, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, uh, as an outside operator, put you in the truck and you're, you know, you're wherever you're, you're operating on your own and trusting that you're going to do what you're supposed to be doing. Um, but honestly, it, it, it didn't, I didn't recognize it at the time. I see, I see it now when we're trying to come in and talk to organizations that how difficult it is to change a culture. 
when I stepped into nuclear power, commercial nuclear power, the culture was set. So I bent to that. I yielded to what that was. I could turn to the guy next to me and say, you know, hey, I don't understand. What, what are we supposed to be doing here? It's okay. I got you. Let me show you. You know, here you go. But when you're trying to bring it into a, um, you know, build it from the ground up, there's really a lot of difficulty in that because we're asking the current people that have a culture that's set to start changing your way, start doing things differently, and trust us that this is going to be a better way. I mean, everybody that's, that's there, is, I would assume, has been pretty successful. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't still be there. Now you got to convince them to change and, and move things. So it, it wasn't tough for me going in because, it, again, I just stepped into the culture and I, I yielded to that. I didn't change their culture. They changed my behaviors, you know, with a strong culture focused on human performance. Uh, but I, I see now these the challenges of these other organizations. We, I was doing a class one time, and somebody asked me, they, like, hey, how long did it take you to learn this? And I really sat there thinking about it. And he was like, yeah, see, it's hard. I'm like, well, no, I'm trying to give you, trying to give you an honest answer because I don't, I didn't remember it being that tough. But it wasn't that tough because the culture was set. Changing a culture is is, is hard because now every you tend to want to default back to your own, uh, you know, what was comfortable or what you're familiar with or what's easy. Um, so th this, this is the struggle. This is the challenge is to make it so easy that um, choosing safety or choosing the right behaviors is the easier option than choosing what we used to. Yeah. Let me ask you a question real quick then. So when you go into some of these organizations that you're actually helping out and they have behavior based safety approach and you have to all of a sudden tell them, not that they're incorrect, because that's not that's not really it. It's that there's a different approach on doing this. Because keep in mind that some of these behavior-based safety programs are pretty expensive to, to kind of put into place. So when you start telling them, not directly of, hey, we're wanting to implement HOP, but you're giving them kind of like the studies, and you're giving them some of the information on what they can do, how do they normally take that information? How receptive are they at the very beginning? Well, it's tough. Like you said, there's the, the cost has been... Uh, you have that sunk cost or that uh, throwing, you know, bad money after good money. You know, it's, it, they, you don't want to admit that that investment or that effort was wrong or, or there's so many things coming at them too. Is this going to be the next flavor of the month? Is it, um, we had an organization that called the, somebody had said, you're just, we hope you're not one of the weebies. I'm like, what's a weebie? And he said, well, we be here when you got here. We be here when you're leaving. <laughs> and it's not going to make much of a difference. I'm like, oh, okay, never heard that. But you know, I hope we're not either. I hope that you know we're here to change it. But you've got to get them to look at you know fundamentally, how's it working? How's that working out for you? You know, not to you know be Dr. Phil on you here, but you know, it's like, are you happy with behavior-based safety? Is that working out well for you? And and our experience, the reason why behavior-based safety was so easy to start. And to, and to latch on to is that it doesn't, it kind of pushes the responsibility down to the worker. So Jay, if me and you were both, you know, out doing a job, the idea is that we're going to coach each other, you know, that, that peer coaching. Um, that wasn't my experience coming up that I'm going to turn to the guy next to me and say, hey, you need to do this and you need to do that. And furthermore, they want to track and trend and pull data so much i need to write this up and say well i saw jay doing this and it wasn't quite right you know so let's get that as a data point well what happens when i'm done writing that thing up me and you got to go back to the same shop uh we're going to have lunch at the same table or we're going to go back to the same office or, or something like that and tomorrow when the two of us get sent out on another job it's going to be your turn to pay back you know give give it back to me um it, it just sets this people don't have People aren't coaching the way that, that we think they are out there. It's just not realistic that, um, you know, I'm going to sit there and tell on you and you're going to tell on me when we're peers. We're just, it just makes it's animosity. It just creates all this tension and that people decide, you know, what's the easier option? Just to check the boxes and say everything went fine. Uh, no hits, no runs, no errors. We, everything was successful and just move it on and get the next job and don't worry about uh, collecting data or trying to see if there's any kind of precursor behaviors or at-risk behaviors or anything like that because it, it makes my life harder to try to coach you because I know you're going to get your opportunity to come back and coach me. 
And we're speaking with David Sowers from Knowledge Vine. Now, let me ask you kind of the reverse question there. So now that you've had this approach and you had the conversation with the leadership and you're talking about behavior-based safety and you gave a really good example on how that would work, how would you address them on how it's done using human organizational performance well, it's interesting that you're already using the terminology behavior organizational performance. Um, it used to be just human performance. Okay. Uh, that has a little bit of a no, which is good. There's there was some connotation there. There's some pushback that that when you come in and you say we want to do a human performance program, that number one the worker will turn. I've literally had people say this to me. It's like, okay, I'm the human. What's wrong with my performance? And we say, well, we're not coming in and saying there's anything wrong with your performance. Well, you're coming in with a human performance program. And so the workers kind of get defensive, get a little bit dug in. It seems like we're just kind of pushing it that way. But the, the other side of that coin is the leadership, the organization, is they feel like they're off the hook. When we say human performance, that's not a us at, in the boardroom thing or in the, you know, the executive washroom. Or it's a them thing. They got to be doing this. We're going to push this down, push it down, push it down. Um, that's where the failure happens is, is if we just keep pushing it onto the worker. And Hello and welcome to Safety FM. That on the line I have David Sowers. Up, he is the vice up. president at Knowledge yeah. Vine. How are you doing you're, today? You're never going to move the needle at all. You're oh, not pretty good. Well, anything. thank you for coming on to Safety um, FM. And we've been kind of communicating back and forth via email. And now that we have you on, what I would like to do, if you don't mind, can you give us a brief description of what your company does? I don't know. Have you ever heard of that? The substitution test after an accident? No, I have not. Okay. It, it's a really easy concept, but you really got to be thinking around it. So when an accident happens, the first thing that happens that you should ask is not who did it or, or anything like that, but say, if I took that person out of that situation and I put an equally qualified person in the same situation, could they make the same decisions and could they make the same error? Nine times out of 10, the answer is going to be yes. They could. They were allowed to make the same decisions or they had the same influences and the same factors on them. They may make the same decision. If that's the case, then it's not really a person problem. It's a process problem. We've got to fix the system. We've got to fix the, the organizational influence. So, David, how did you get started down this path? Because I know normally most people don't wake up and say, hey, I want to get into the safety profession um, and definitely looking at the new aspect of stuff say, and then jumping like in into doing this. So what got you involved in safety? Organizational performance. It doesn't let the organization off the hook. They understand that they have a role in whether we are encouraging uh, safe behaviors or whether we're encouraging shortcuts and, and um, uh, workarounds and things like that that will lead to accidents and, and uh, different and errors. Well, as you are aware, HOP has like so many different names depending on who you're speaking with. I've had a conversation with people where they've told me safety, safety differently or safety 2.0, but I was told that human performance was used for a period of time and then exactly what you stated earlier about the organization feeling like they were off the hook but also at the same time when you mention the word organization people that are inside of the organization say well, oh crap now we're responsible too for part of this so now we need to be involved a little bit more so i guess it's kind of an interesting twist and i'm, I'm sure you know that things always change in regards of names and there's not a particular name that will work better than the other now when i sit here and i listen to you kind of give the response i know that a lot of people will say well it's either behavior-based safety or it's human organizational performance. Now, do you feel in the different activities that you're able to do with Knowledge Vine, where it's kind of a combination of both, or do you just see more, more along the lines that it's really one or the other? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, typically, we there's elements in both. I, I guess I wouldn't say it, it would be an either or that hard line. I mean, there's elements in both that that are good. Uh, we do default to you know the hop or the the human performance. Um, we think it hits more um, what the organization needs, what the worker needs, uh, gets away from that. But there's nothing wrong with uh, you know encouraging peer coaching or, or you know tracking data as long as you're getting the right data, as long as the coaching isn't. Um, kind of not the whole of it it's just a, a subset of it just understanding that you know i am my brother or my sister's keeper well that that's fine we've got to be open to that we have to be open to communicating that not putting the wrong kind of peer pressure on each other and making sure that we're open to um giving and receiving uh coaching for you know from a co-worker um it's amazing the number of incidents that we've you know been asked to kind of help come in and look at uh where the the conversation right before somebody got you know sick seriously hurt or, or even killed was the uh, you know the older person 
uh, doing the work and the younger person going, hey, that doesn't quite look right. And the old timer is like, I, yeah, I got this. Go sit in the truck. Don't don't worry about it. I've done this a thousand times. And then something happens. You know, so that's, if you have a culture that doesn't allow that that, that coaching, that communication, uh, we've missed opportunities to protect each other, to identify, uh, you know, risky situations or risky behaviors. So, you know, behavior-based safety from that aspect, if, if we can get it done right, um, it's not it's not bad. I, I wouldn't throw it all out, but we definitely default to the um, uh, the hop side of things or the human performance side of things because it really does look at the the, the bigger picture. Um, you familiar with uh, James Reason's Swiss cheese model? Have you? Yes, I've heard it before. Something you've, yeah, they, basically it's just saying, and everybody inherently kind of knows this. When there's an accident, um, people say things like, "Man, the stars aligned." You know, everything just kind of worked out bad. It worked out the wrong way. If we'd have been two seconds later or two feet to the left or the right or something, we would have avoided it. Or, you know, all those little what ifs, all these things. Well, the James Reason Swiss cheese model basically is saying that if you think of a piece of cheese as a, as a barrier, a defense, so what are we doing to um, reduce the likelihood that we're going to have an error to, to make our systems more resilient against error? So, like a good defense would be having the proper PPE or having uh, good management or having procedures or having equipment that works right. You know, those sort of things that help set us up for success. Well, when we don't have the right PPE or we don't have a policy or we don't have a procedure, we're kind of punching holes in that defense, in that barrier. Um, when those holes line up, that's where the error comes and happens. And that last line of defense is usually the worker. And the worker is pretty good about stopping all these shots on goals. But the idea around you know behavior-based safety is let's make better goalies. Whereas if you get into human performance or hop, we're looking at the bigger picture and saying, let's stop the number of shots on goals. Let's not get goalies that can stop you know, 30 shots a game, let's play defense a little bit better and make our goalies only have to stop, you know, four or five shots a game. You know, that, that increases our likelihood that we're not going to have those errors. And if we're not focusing on that upstream, those barriers and those defensive defenses that break down, that help set our people up to make errors, then we're not really going to get to the root of, of fixing the problem. Because again, we could pull that goalie out, stick the next goalie in, and it's only a matter of time before they make the same mistakes or, or allow the same number of shots through because we haven't fixed the system. We haven't fixed the problem. So what would you say to the people that believe that taking that whole answer that you just referenced, that essentially human organizational performance is a get out of jail free card for the employee or team member? Well, there's, we talk about that. That's a great question. Um, the, there's a difference between an error and a violation. So with you, with the best of intentions, with the information that came to you, you looked at something and you said, I, I see the risk, but I think it's manageable. Um, I'm, I'm going to try to go at it this way. And you make that mistake or you have that error. There's a breakdown and something happens. Typically, we'll say that's not let's not get into discipline. Not, let's not hammer that person and, and play whack-a-mole. And again, we can fire them but we could put somebody back into the same system and, and it's just a matter of time before they'll make the same mistake or the same decision with the same influences. In a violation, you've got a clear rule, you've got a clear policy, everything is set up to uh, for success to give the person exactly what they need and there's no ambiguity, there's no misunderstanding that that person can make that decision that I know how they want me to do it, I know what the rule is, but I'm just going to do it this way. You know, that conscious decision that I'm going to uh, work around something or violate a rule or violate a policy, that's that's not human error. That, that's a violation. So, again, that can get gray. That can get uh, that's a, sort of a moving target was this because you're, you're, you're kind of talking about their intent a little bit, which is sometimes hard to define. You know, but when you can discern that the, the intent and I, I, it amazes me. We've sat in, again, meetings for root cause analysis and, and things like that. And they're talking to the individual and it's like, did you know the rule? Oh, yeah. So you knew you were violating the rule. Right. But that's how I used to do it at my old company. So I wanted to do it that way. Okay. But we told you, we, you know, this is how we do it here because it's safer. Oh, yeah. I understood that. But I decided to do that. And, you know, on the inside, you're kind of cringing going, you know, dude, be quiet. <laughs> you're, you're hanging your butt. 
again, that's that's a violation. That's not that's not really an error. So it's not that everybody's off the hook and no, you know, people are blameless and you can never, you know, discipline if there's a human performance program. I mean, you can if if, if we're talking violations, not errors. And truth be told, if somebody's wanting to violate the rules. Uh, they're not just putting themselves at risk, but they're putting everybody around them at risk. I don't want that person working next to me anyway. You know, you, you do need to get either get their attention or, or get them out of the way because uh, it's, it's not always the person that makes the mistake is, isn't always the one that gets hurt. You know, sometimes it's the person next to them, which is unfortunate. And we just don't want that element in the uh, in our workplaces. So how do you actually turn around and be able to prove that the person did the violation? I mean, let's be realistic. You know, not everybody's going to be 100% honest, especially once they're caught doing something incorrectly. How would you go about being able to prove that using the human organizational performance concept? Well, the from a human organizational performance concept, you're not, you're not focusing on, you know, how do we prove that they did this, you know, on purpose or what their intent was. Uh, there has to be some uh, trust built within the organization. If you don't have trust, you're not going to get that near miss reporting. Uh, if they understand that the uh, the mistake is not going to be met with, um, you know, with, with discipline every time, that they understand that the organ or the organ the organization demonstrates that they know they have a role in fixing this problem, then um, people will be a little bit more forthcoming if they, you know, if they that self-preservation doesn't kick in where I better just, you know, cover up and and not say anything. And we're not going to get any kind of learning because I don't want people to learn that I messed up. Um, If we can, if they can build that trust by showing that, um, yeah, we saw people made, this person made a mistake and we gave them a fair shake and we did, you know, it wasn't a discipline thing. It was a coaching thing or maybe a remediation thing. Then um, uh, people will be more likely to be forthcoming. Um, that is a good question. If somebody is just going to sit there and clearly, you know, everybody knows you, you violated this, um, I, the best way to track that is is if there is training that was given or an expectation that was set that, or you know, we all signed in on the training or we all verified that we understood what the rule was. You know, these these cardinal rules or these these uh, fundamental safety rules that we all you know agree to adhere by and live by. Um, there's not. I'm not aware of like a a real process that says, let's try to root that out. Let me ask you something real quick, because you did reference something in particular, and I'm kind of curious on when people are going from behavior-based safety, going into human organizational performance on how you're able to get this converted over. When it comes to near miss reporting, a lot of operators, and I'll just tell you from previous experience, do not want to give you the near miss information because they are under the belief that they're going to be held accountable for what they report later on. So during review time or later on, when you're doing a checkup on them or so on, you might remember, hey, you gave me this near miss, which essentially could have been potentially your fault. And now I'm going to hold you accountable. How can you get your employees slash team members to get out of that mindset to be able to be open and have that trust with you? It is. There is no magic bullet for this. This is a, a harken back to my Navy days. It takes you a mile and a half to turn an aircraft carrier. It takes even longer to turn a culture and an organization around uh, that near miss reporting. I want to tell you how I messed up so we can learn from it. Um, you, you have to start building that trust. You have to I'll, I'll, you go the opposite way when somebody says, I had a near miss. It's, I don't want to say celebrated, but the fact that they brought this forward and that we all get to learn from this. Near misses are phenomenal. I mean, you get, it, it's like eating the meal without paying the check. You can get all the learning. You can get all the education. You can get all the improvement. You can fix your processes without that loss of life or damage of equipment or, or significant injuries or any of that. But we're, we're afraid to talk about them. We won't, we won't look at them. We won't let them happen. We'll never get that information. It's just one at a time. It's when somebody comes forward and says, I messed up. You, you don't discipline. You thank them for bringing it forward. And you, you actually hold that up as a strong example. We had a company that... Um, uh, last year, we were working with them. We'd go in and do some refresher training with them. And it was a series of classes. The very last one, this guy just kind of raised his hand in the class and said, I want to tell you about a near miss I had. And it was the first he had talked about it. You know, but the, the organization was very you know progressive in how, in, or very advanced in their human performance program. He starts telling us how this happened with the, the president of the company who's in the room and the, the you know the vice president, the operations manager, and everybody's in the room that you would think he would be afraid to, to bring this up to. And he starts t- 
talking about it. And the way they responded, I thought was phenomenal. They said, next year, this guy is going to go to every class with you. And he's with me when we, we uh, with Knowledge Vine, when we went to go redo this for the next, for the 2018 refresher, he's going to go to every class and he's going to tell his story. He's going to share with everybody how that happened. That's a very powerful message that, you know, we're, we're so thankful that you brought this forward, just this one event, and said, I, I could have, I knew better, but I did this, and I, sh- I should have done that, and I'm here to tell you, and I, I learned my lesson, and I'm glad I didn't learn it by hurting myself or someone else, and he went from, uh, you know, session to session, telling the story, and they heard it from their own guy. It wasn't just the leadership saying, yeah, he told us, and, and it was good. He, in his own words, and, and showing his own vulnerability, but okay with it, because he knew that the organization was more interested in learning than they were in disciplining. And that had such a big impact that they could they actually track and trend and they can see that they're starting to get more and more of that near miss reporting, which just starts to snowball and we're going to learn and we're going to improve and get better and better and better because of it. And so many other people are probably freaking out inside of that room going, why is this guy admitting all this information? But that's a good thing that they had at least had that response in regards of saying, hey, Let's go ahead and move forward and have him tell this story to everybody else. So that's really good that they took a different approach onto it because I will tell you, just dealing with different organizations, normally when you first have that changeover or attempting to do that changeover, it's like, you did what? And now you're telling us? So I'm glad that they did take that approach on there. Now, let me ask you a strange question. When you're going in and you're having to take a look at the different approaches that people take, what are some of the most... I guess, what are the biggest misconceptions that people have about human organizational performance? One that you touched on, you know, earlier is the, um, is anybody at fault? Is, are we all just blameless? Is it all just, you know, part of the system? That's one we get, you know, we, and, and again, we have to coach a lot on, um, most of the time that is the case, that it was just somebody was set up to make a mistake and they just triggered it. You know, you need to think of the person that, that made the error or the mistake or had the accident as more of a victim than a culprit. All that, you talk about the Swiss cheese model, right? All the holes align, the stars align, and he spent all day long uh, stopping these shots on goal, but this one got through, and now we want to act like he's a bad guy, he or she's a bad person, and um, uh, we blaming them or, 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 or getting into that, getting away from that, where we're getting into, and start getting into, let's understand, how did we get this far? Not who made the accident, but how did this happen? How did we get to this point? What were the breakdowns that we can fix so we don't put the next person into the same situation? The other, uh, again, the other big pushback is with behavior-based safety. It's it's a very bottom-up approach, um, and we get a lot of pushback from leadership and, and upper management. They're kind of used to, hey, this sounds like a good program. If these people would do it. You know, I think it could work. I could see the benefit. So here it is. You go do that. I don't have a whole lot of responsibility around this other than, you know, somebody's going to report the numbers to me every once in a while. We're going to see if we're making any kind of improvement or, or uh, any kind of progress. Um, when you walk in and say, you know, hey, you're not off the hook. You know, you've got, as part of the organization, you've got a responsibility you to lead this, to fix things that are broken and not just... Um, you know, leave it to the worker all the time. That's that's a big push. Nobody's raising their hands and saying, you know, I've got time to do more stuff. You know, they want to just kind of keep it steady state, keep doing what they're doing. Maybe we'll give them another program. We'll get another set of uh, posters up or we'll get some hard hat stickers or something like that to make it all look fresh. But I don't really want to have a whole lot of involvement or a whole lot of engagement in this. I just want to provide them the solution that they can go with. When we start pushing on, no, no, you've, you've got a role in this. You're part of the solution, and you, you've got to show that you have this commitment. It's really a handshake between the workers and, and, the, and the leadership and the organization that, all right, I'm going to try to be more aware of my behaviors and the traps that set me up and putting tools in place to you know mitigate uh, the wrong decisions. I'll give you that effort, but you've got to meet me halfway, too, and start fixing some of the things that are wrong within the organization. We're going to start shoring up those, those breakdowns in our defenses and our barriers through a better process of policy, procedures, PPE, you know, all the things that help uh, set us up to do that. That's a, a real big pushback, too. When somebody, you can sniff it out pretty quick when we go in to talk to some of these organizations, whether this is just going to be a check-the-box exercise or whether there's a real commitment 
to changing and improving and uh, stopping all the shots on goal versus just yelling at the goalie because he let a couple of them get through. So let me ask you a question about that. When you actually have a conversation with an organizational leader and you tell them, just because your numbers are good does not mean that you're safe. How do they take that information at first? How are they able to cope with that? Because they go, well, our our lagging indicators have been excellent for X amount of time. And all of a sudden you're telling them, but you're not safe. How does that conversation normally go, especially you coming in as a consultant? Well, they live and die by the numbers. I mean, that's everybody, it's that snapshot. It's that Cliff Notes version of how are we doing when we want to measure the absence of accidents or errors or all that. And, And so as we get a long enough timeline we can see that you know all these indicators are are up or down or whichever way we need them going and we're just programmed to that's how we measure success um we don't think of of luck factoring into this a whole lot i mean you you could have you know jay i could go out and and you task me with the job i can go out there and do the job and i can take every shortcut in the in the book if you're not looking at behaviors if you're just crunching numbers and I come back, I wasn't hurt, I got it done on time, you know, on time, under budget, whatever all, whatever the indicators are, and uh, no accidents, no errors, and I hand you back the paperwork, I'm like, done, and you sit there and you say, hey, good job, Dave. You, you, you really nailed, did I, do a, did I do a good job? I took every shortcut there was. I took every risk I could think about. I just got away with it because we're all, everybody, all of the workers all over the place are pretty adept at navigating the minefield because we know where the landmines are. It's the same thing with the organization. Just, you know, the, the absence of, of the action, if the behaviors are bad, it's, it's just a matter of time. If the decisions are bad, we can get a long way on luck, but luck's not a strategy. We need to employ better behavior so we're making better choices so we get more consistent results and more predictable results around the right behaviors rather than, you know, we got away with it, we're lucky, everything worked out. Um, that's a tough argument to make because again well i mean some of these people we're talking to their bonuses their compensation is tied to what do these numbers look like and if they're not if they're not good you know now we're coming in and saying you know you're not really safe it's like well i beg to differ we've got great numbers right and and that's a lot of the myth and that's a lot of the misconception out there in the field is that just because your numbers are good does not actually mean that you're great at safety because the things that injure people are not always the exact same things that kill people and we tend to forget that and i'm talking about just in general because when you talk to upper management and i'm not saying upper management does not know what's going on in safety but i think that sometimes they don't put the emphasis on it like other items so like if you have a production issue or if you have something else that's going on they don't put as much emphasis on it I think there's been a little bit of a turn now that there's been the conversation about the highest levels of executive is held accountable for the safety of an organization. So that's kind of got a lot of attention because of that. But I always find it interesting on when you probably have to go in and have these conversations on how those things go. So if you walk into an organization and they're saying, hey, we used to do behavior based safety, we've decided to bring you on as a consultant. And all of a sudden now we want to tie you into doing human organizational performance for our company. Do they normally say, I want this done in X timeline. Is that kind of like an expectation when they when you first walk in the door, or what? Are they, how does that conversation normally go? Well, if, if we're brought in because um, there was some foresight and some thought around, you know, we've been doing behavior based safety, but we're you know we, we're seeing some gaps in it, and we we really want that we really want to bring you guys in to try to take that next step or go to the next level. Um, they have typically have that understanding that this is going to take a little bit of time and there's going to be a little bit of commitment on your part. The, um, when we walk in, we come in like after an accident or a fatality or something and people are like, Hey, we need help. You know, some, usually they don't ask a lot of questions because they, um, they know they need to do something and they just kind of, Hey, we're in your hands. You got to help us out. We, 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 if it takes time, it's going to take time. We're going to put the resources and commitment into it. That third scenario where we come in is where somebody's like, you know what, we think it would be a good idea. We're a contractor and the company we work for, they say, let's, uh, you know, do you have a human performance program? Do you have a hot program? Because if you're going to be on our site, we want you as safe as possible. When we step into those situations, that's where you start to get that sense that this is a check the box exercise, that they are wanting to say, okay, we do have a human performance or a hot program so we can, you know, for contracting or, you know, when we're communicating with uh, potential clients of their own, they can say, oh yeah, we have this 
uh, a competitive advantage because we're using, utilizing a human performance program. They're, again, just looking at the numbers and playing with the numbers and hoping that this will help make them more profitable to have, but there's not that real commitment to uh, safety. We're not really looking at it through a lens of how can we be safer, how can we set our people up for success and try to eliminate uh, the, the, the shots on goals that are continually taken. They're just looking at you know, how does this get that next contract. That's the ones where it's how quick can we do this? How soon can we roll this out? You know, do you want to put our people in a class? Well, I don't, you know, oh, I don't know if we can take them out of the field for, you know, a couple of hours to, to you know, uh, do some training. And um, they really start to try to scale things back. And we've, we've had situations where we've had to back out and just say, hey, this, you know, our reputation is on the line too. You know, we're, our success is tied to your success. If we come in here and, uh, you know, put the knowledge vine seal of approval uh, on this and then you guys have a fatality, you know, our, our credibility shot. We can't, we just can't take that risk and, and we don't want to be engaged in that. So we've actually had to back away from some companies but that um, kind of made it clear early on that, that this is just a check the box exercise. We don't have real commitment to it. But if they have real commitment, we don't usually get a ton of pushback. They know it's going to take a little bit of time to, to um, again, turn that ship. That almost seems like a waste to bring you in then if they already know that it's going to be a check the box exercise. And I would imagine that has to be a very difficult conversation to have and go, well, I appreciate you reaching out, but at the same time, we're probably not going to be the best fit for you. Well, it, it is. And I've never gotten the feedback, but I've always been curious that if it has, um, we don't put this out, but if you go into that boardroom and, and if they're saying, hey, we're talking to Knowledge Mind, they're going to come in and they're going to help us. And then the next week we're not there it's not happening you know if, if it got out to the workers that you know hey they they turned us down because we weren't really committed to safety what does that say to your workforce um just i've always been curious if that if that ever crept out like that it wouldn't come from our end of things but if it's inside the organization somebody's like well wait a minute we were going to do this now we're not doing it you know why is that oh because this this organization that come to their consultants they're um you know they're paid to come in here and consult and they said you know what we'd rather not get paid to consult in this organization something's significantly broken that would that would really that would concern me if i was um one of the frontline workers there to say okay this if we're just doing some dog and pony show stuff we don't have a real commitment to my safety we just you know the illusion of safety or, or chasing those numbers and and the other side of that, it's focusing on those numbers too much, is that's going to encourage you to not report. You know, we're going to try to, we're going to, if things happen, we're going to say, well, maybe, maybe that's not OSHA recordable. Maybe that's not a lost time or, you know, finding ways to not report and massage those numbers and things like that. So if you're focused on those numbers, you're focused on the wrong things. you got to focus on the behaviors that's going to lead us to get the better numbers organically and naturally. Yeah, I can't imagine what the morale would look like if somebody says, "Yeah, they decided not to not to pick us up." That's I would imagine it's a totally different story. Well, David, I had a question for you. If the, our listeners want to get more information about you or Knowledge Vine, where can they go? They can go to uh, knowledgevine dot com. We have a website there. Um, there's a lot of resources. Um, we really do focus on the application piece. You know, it's not just an awareness thing. Uh, the information you, you kind of alluded to it earlier. The DOE handbook has. A whole section on a human performance and hop and um, there's some great books out there and a lot of different organizations the, the information is out there what you do with that information is uh, is what's key so on our website is a ton of information we've got some blogs we've got some videos that explain you know human performance explain the tools and traps we're just there take them use them we got an app um, it's a kv a kilo victor share um, it's on the apple store or the uh um, was it iTunes or can't remember that, Google Play? Um, it's available there that has the same kind of resources in there too. All the we just give the information because the information doesn't mean a whole lot if we don't know how to apply it. You know, you don't you didn't learn how to play football by watching a PowerPoint. You know, you learn some of the basics when you got out in the field and coach, and that's really where our niche is is, is getting in the field because we came from the field. We understand the challenges of the worker and understand what they need to actually apply these uh, and uh, move the needle and, and create real change. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and its guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the company. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are only examples. 
They should not be utilized in the real world as the only solution available as they are based only on very limited and dated open source information. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the company. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic, recording, or otherwise, without prior written permission of the creator of the podcast, Jay Allen. Safety FM, changing safety cultures, one broadcast and one podcast at a time. Join the fun on on social media and find us on Facebook at Safety FM.